Thanks, John. Um, I want to thank John Mulholland for inviting me to come back to Glenties. I, I was thrilled to, uh, to get the invitation. Um, I was a bit less thrilled when I realized that the session I was asked to participate in was titled, With Huge Debt and Resulting Austerity, Is Serious Economic Growth Possible? I felt like taking a pill after reading it. Um, so the problem with, with, with a question like that um, is it, it, it's a bit of a hospital pass. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer. And, and even if I figure out the answer, I'm probably going to make everyone really depressed. Um, but look, I'll give it a go. I'll try not to be too depressing. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll follow orders. I, the, the politicians may stick to the message and say whatever they want to say. But I'll, 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 I'll try to talk about what Joe wants me to talk about. I'll talk about debt and the relationship between debt and austerity. And then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the outlook for, for growth. Um, now, not to be too obsessed with the title of the session, but let's go back and take a look at it. Uh, it says, with huge debt and resulting austerity, dot, dot, dot. Um, now, that implicitly expresses a view uh, that's very common today, which is that the reason that we have austerity is because of the large amounts of debts that we've run up. And in particular, in the public's mind, and there's a good reason for this to be foremost in the public mind, it's because of the large amounts of debts that we've run up in relation to uh, the banking bailout. And, and in the public mind, to a significant extent, the two are linked. It's because of we have run up all this debt from the banks that we have this austerity. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that the truth is a bit more complex than that. Um, I mean, look, at one level, it's clear there is a link between debt and austerity. Uh, if a country had no public debt whatsoever, and yet the government still had access to taxation revenue, uh, then, yeah, most sovereign bond investors, you know, guys in financial markets, would be willing to lend money uh, to that government because they'd be good for it, right? They've no debt. But, you know, that's not a very realistic assessment of where we are almost no matter what we would have done in the past few years. So, for example, Ireland is supposed to end up with a peak debt-to-GDP ratio of 120% uh, sometime next year, year after. Now, 40 points of that 120 can be traced to the banking bailout. Now, let's suppose that it didn't happen, never happened, we never had a bank bailout. We'd still have a debt ratio of 80% of GDP. And the question you want to ask yourself in is, whether or not a country with a debt ratio of 80% of GDP can keep running budget deficits, spending more than they're taking in, of about 10% of GDP, which is about where we've been the last few years. Uh, and the answer to that is no. Um, so, well, the burden of the bank debt uh, and taking on this debt may be infuriating, and I, I've done my time you know, complaining about this and talking about how we should get it down and various strategies and mistakes that have been made. Um, but we have to accept that directly linking austerity with, uh, with the, the, the debt and the debt level that we have is a mistake. Um, and I, and I, I think that, that lots of people have will, will think about some of the austerity measures, like take the property tax, right? So Phil Hogan was here today and got a very warm reception, I hear. Um, and a lot of people perfectly understandably will say things like, well, why should I pay my property tax just so that, you know, bankers who gambled and, and made mistakes, you know, get paid their money back? And, and that's completely understandable, and there is some element of truth to that. But I think the onus is really on the government now to engage with that debate and, and, and provide the response that basically you're, you're paying your property taxes because we need to pay for public services and we need to pay for welfare, welfare benefits. And in that sense, the, the, the banking debt element of the debate is, is, is proving to be a sort of a, a, a toxic and unhelpful element. Now on the flip side of this, I think people also need to be careful about this idea that there is some great upside 
to any potential deal that the Irish government does with the European Union in relation to bank debt. So we have these ongoing negotiations and talk about there may be a deal in October. But for the same reason that even if there was no bank debt, we would still have to reduce the budget deficit. The government simply can't afford, even if it gets a very good deal, to turn around and say, that's it, folks, austerity is cancelled. Um, so I, I just think that we have to, to some extent, separate the two. Now, Ireland also, when we think about huge debts, we don't just have a public debt problem. We have a very significant problem with private debts. There are people up and down the country that took on debts in, in good faith and not necessarily recklessly uh, that they thought that they could pay back and now it turns out that they're struggling with them and there's businesses and households up and down the country struggling with the debt burdens. Um, and it'll probably take years to resolve that kind of problem. You know, we, we, th th these are not easy problems to resolve. They either take years because people have to work through and try to save money and, uh, uh, and, and, and tighten their belts or it takes years because, in many cases, people simply cannot pay back, you know, under any reasonable scenario. And the debt needs to be written off, restructured in whatever way, but we need processes for that, and that's a, that's a complicated issue. So that, that whole issue of, 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 of debt, uh, private debt, is also contributing to Ireland's uh, debt problem. We also have banks that are downsizing. So in the past, you may have found it easier to borrow most of the money to buy a house. You may have found it easier to borrow money to buy a car or whatever. All of these kind of things were easier. And uh, so we don't just have a debt problem in the sense that there's debts that people can't afford, but we have a debt problem in that people can't take on new debts to spend money on things in the way that they could in the past. And so all of these problems, public sector debt, to my mind, the combination of private debt and tight credit is probably as important right now in terms of depressing the economy as the more obvious fiscal austerity that, that we can see coming from the government. Now, this picture of, of an economy that has both a private debt problem and a public debt problem is probably very familiar to people uh, when, when they look at Ireland and look at the Irish economy. But the thing is, you can actually repeat this picture across a number of European economies, and, and it will look quite similar. So for instance, you could, if you go to places like Spain, places like Portugal, you'll find that not only is the government running uh, a big and unsustainable deficit, but also the private sector, you know, regular people uh, and businesses have, have, an awful lot of, uh, have an awful lot of debt. And there's a big debate in Europe today about that. And the tendency of the, the politicians and, 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 and indeed, I would say, regular citizens in what you might call the core Eurozone countries of Germany, uh, Finland, Netherlands, and so on, is to say, well, the solution to all of this is very simple. Um, if the government is spending more than it's taking in taxation, they need to tighten their belt and just get on with it. And the same way if, if a household is has a debt problem, if they've been spending more than they've taken in taxation, we know that the model for them is the, 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 the infamous Swabian housewife who balances her books in some very special way that it turns out housewives don't uh, in the rest of the world. Um, and that's a very attractive you know, proposition to people in a lot of Europe. You know, those people, they seem to have lots of debts and they're living beyond their means and they need to just basically cop themselves on. And as with a lot of seemingly attractive sort of simple prescriptions, it turns out if you use the analytical tools of my chosen profession, not just economics, macroeconomics, if you, if you, if you take a step back and look up at this, it, it turns out to not be so simple because in, in the world economy as a whole, one of the things that we teach in Economics 101 is that spending equals income. Where does, where does your income come from? Your income comes from that other people go and spend money. Okay? So it's very simple to say, yeah, all these countries out there in the world need to just spend less than they're taking in an income, and then they'll solve their debt problems. The problem is it's physically impossible 
as a matter of an identity. And what you'll find in the global economy right now is there's a lot of countries that have this great plan to spend less uh, uh, that they'll t than they'll take in an income. And that can't work. Um, another great identity that we teach in, 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 in macroeconomics 101, well, how exactly can an individual country, okay, the, the world can't uh, uh, make more uh, or spend less uh, than it earns in income, but an individual country could. Now, how do they do that? If you cut through it all, the way they do that is you can sell more in exports than you get back in imports. And this is where the whole debate in Europe about competitiveness comes from. You know, countries like Ireland just need to sell more exports than they take in imports. So we need to be to have cheap products that we can sell around the world and people need to cut wages and, and we need to be more competitive. Again, the problem with that is that practically every country in the world thinks that they're going to run trade surpluses as the way to solve their debt problems. Right? Every country out, the, out in the world seems to think that they're going to end up exporting more than they import as a solution to their problems. But unless we come up with trade links with Mars, that's not going to happen. Right? So when you start to look at uh, what this picture is, it's a picture of lots of countries in Europe and around the world cutting spending. And because they're cutting spending, income is falling as well. And everybody's sort of chasing their tail. Now, Against that background, if you look at countries like Portugal and Spain and Greece, you know, things don't look so good. Um, to the people in, in, in the core countries, the politicians of the core countries, their solution is to say, well, you need to reform. You need reforms. We had reforms under Gerhard Schroeder. We reformed our labor markets and the economy started to do better. We started to uh, 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 make more in exports than we did in imports. Not that long ago, Germany was called the sick man of Europe, and today we think of them as this industrial powerhouse. So they say, well, we've done this, and you can do it too. Now, my own view is that the Germans have sort of overlearned this particular lesson. If you go back and look at the period of the Schroeder labor market reforms, you'll see that it was a period when there was economic growth in all of their export partners. So they had people to sell their products to and expanding markets, and that made it much easier to introduce these kind of reforms. It's also the case that when they reformed their labor market and they had years of, well, what do they have years of? They had years of, of low amounts of wage growth, right? There was a lot of years where average wage growth in Germany was close to zero. Um, and that's very, very hard to do, but that's doable. But much, much harder to do for all sorts of social reasons uh, and psychological reasons. What's much harder to do is to ask people to take large, wage cuts, large nominal wage cuts. And that's, that's true in Germany as well. German workers during this period did not, you know, offer themselves up for 10, 20%, 30% wage cuts and say, to say, we must be more competitive. Please cut my wages, right? You don't see that. It's extremely hard to do. At the current pace that we're going at in lots of peripheral economies, um, it's not clear that we're gonna have the time to wage cut these economies. <laughs> Back, back to growth in a way that's going uh, to keep the euro together. Now, an alternative would be, be to have a sort of a, a bilateral approach to adjustment, that countries in the periphery would look to cut wages and uh, uh, try to boost their exports. But other countries that don't have big debt problems, like Germany, would decide to spend more, would decide to encourage the, the, the higher wage increases in, in, in wage negotiations and so on. And then there would be markets to sell to and we could kind of both both move a little little bit in the, in, in the direction. I mean, one way to think of that is that that provides a sort of a carrot for countries that are struggling in Europe, uh, you know, over and above the stick of you need to cut your wages and you need to have budget cuts. Um, unfortunately, thus far anyway, German economic policymakers are dead set against, against anything like this. Um, I read a very depressing speech recently by the, 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 the president of the Bundesbank, uh, Jens Weidmann. And partly it was a very clever speech. He understood the problems in Europe and the nature of the imbalances. And he, he 
basically said, yeah, you know, one way we could deal with this would be, as well as you guys cutting your wages and cutting your budget deficits, we could spend a bit more. And then he said, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. We don't, we don't, don't believe in that. It's, it's up to you guys to, to adjust. Um, and I, I, I think the clock is ticking on this sort of what I might call the stick-only approach to, to saving the euro. Now, against that kind of slightly depressing background, um, what are the prospects for Ireland? Uh, and what are the prospects for growth? Right? Joe asked me to talk about growth. Um, well, one thing we can be clear about is that domestic demand in Ireland is going to be weak uh, for a long time. The government is going to be raising taxes and cutting spending for the next number of years, whatever government. Right? There was an election in the morning and Mary Lou was in government. Sinn Féin would be raising taxes and cutting spending. This is, this is, a, this is, this is just a fact. Um, we're also going to have these debt problems that's going to make it harder for people to go out in the shops and spend money, and the banks are not going to be offering people credit uh, the way that they used to, probably ever again. So they're facts. Uh, so, as with all the other peripheral economies, the way that the Irish economy is going to grow again, if it's going to grow, is that it's going to export, and we're going to have an export-led uh, uh, you know, economy. Now, I've already kind of rubbished that idea as everybody's solution, okay? But if I go and look at, at Ireland, I actually think that the underlying news here is better than many people might think. Um, if you look very hard beyond the sort of ravages of debt and recession and look at the Irish economy, you know, you might be surprised at how good the underlying economy actually is. Um, one thing we can say is that Ireland already has had the largest adjustment in terms of its wage costs uh, relative to any of the other European countries. We talked about how these countries have to export more than they import if they're ultimately going to be able to pay off all their public and private debts. Well, unfortunately, Spain, Portugal, and in particular Greece are actually running very large current account deficits. So they're just very, very far away from that position. Ireland has a current account that's about now in balance. Right? So there's a much, about as much money coming into the country as there is going out. So that's a much better fundamental position uh, than a lot of those other countries. Uh, our friends from the Troika uh, arrive in every quarter and they, uh, they give us lectures about the need for reforms. Um, well, you know, uh, the World Bank does a, a very comprehensive assessment of how easy it is to do business in a country. And, you know, Ireland scores 10th in the world. Right? It's the 10th best place to do business in the world. So you'll, you'll, you'll hear people say we're drowning in red tape and this and the other. Well, if we are, we're drowning in less red tape than they are in the rest of the world. Right? So, you know, for the record, Germany uh, scores 19th in the world for doing business. And France scores 29th. So, you know, they can arrive every quarter and give us, give us, uh, give us lectures, but it, in fact, Ireland is a pretty good place to do business. Uh, Ireland has very high productivity levels in terms of how much GDP, how much output is, is generated by each worker. And that's still true even after the crash. Right? This has been an employment-driven crash. The reason GDP is down by so much is because we have so many less people at, at work being productive, right? The productivity of an unemployed worker is zero. Um, and with wages and rents cheaper than they were before and, and other things that made Ireland attractive like the low corporate tax rate still in place um, we are in many ways if you are a multinational firm and you want to come to Ireland largely to service uh, the European export market we're actually a much better place to come and do business now than we were back in 2007 and you can see that that the pipeline of, of, of projects, uh, FDI projects coming through the IDA is, apparent, is apparently very good. Now this is not to say that we're going to return to the kind of growth rates that we saw of the Celtic Tiger. There was a lot of once-off factors occurred during the Celtic Tiger period. I mean, you don't see many economies around the world that grow at 7, 8, 9, 10 percent and do it for year, year in, year out. So it has to be some set of unusual factors happened and, and there were a number of very unusual factors. The demographic patterns in Ireland, uh, 
uh, uh, were, were, were very unusual. We had this huge inflow of, of young workers coming into the labor force. We had very low labor force participation rates. You know, female labor force participation in Ireland in the 1980s was incredibly low, and then it soared to be sort of normal by international standards. Uh, I said we're very productive now. Yes, we are very productive. We were not that productive in the 1980s. It was a lot of productivity growth. But, you know, all of those trends can't be extrapolated, you know, out again. You know, we can't go and, you know, get this, can't, we can't, can't change our demographics. We already have a reasonably high level of labor force participation. Uh, we can be productive, we can be as productive as a lot of the other produ productive countries in the world. There's no particular reason to think that we're so special that we're gonna be 50% more productive than anybody else. So a lot of those sources of growth are gone. What you're left with is that we have 15% of the workforce unemployed in a country that is productive and has a lot of attractive aspects. And ultimately, that means that things will be better in the future. We will be able to put those people back to work. The economy has a lot of what you might call expansion room, room to grow. Um, now, in the shorter term, there's only so much we can control. Um, as long as the global economy remains in a slump, and as long as the Euro crisis keeps rumbling on, upsetting everybody, uh, it's hard to see a quick return to the kind of export-led growth that, that we need. And to be honest, I, I really think at this point only, only a fool could rule out that there are serious crises ahead of us, you know, could say that the Euro is going to stay together for sure. I, I wouldn't stand here tonight and say that for sure. Uh, I think only a fool would say that Ireland can't have a sovereign debt default. I, I, that, that is, all, those things are possible, cataclysmic events and serious events, maybe in our sovereign debt default is not cataclysmic, but those kind of things may be in front of us. But I'm tempted to finish up by saying that, that, that in the long run, the Irish economy will get back on track. And then I remember that whenever you say that, people remind you that Keynes said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. And, and, and I'm, I wanna be more optimistic than that. So. I guess I'll just say the next few years are, are, are pretty much bound to be rough, no matter what. And people who try to tell you that, that, that there's some magic recipe to make the next few years be easy uh, uh, are, are selling snake oil. But we will pull through the crisis one way or the other. Uh, and I think that when we do, I think we'll be able to put our economy on a sustainable path. And I, I think a lot of lessons have been learned. I think we will put the economy on a more sustainable path than it was during the so-called Celtic Tiger uh, 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 golden period. So with that attempt to be optimistic, I'll go sit back in my chair. Thank you.